Okay, so good morning and uh, welcome. I think this is the fifth, la the last day, right? Okay, okay. So, you have had a quite a variety of uh, lectures and I think lab visit and so on. Fine. So, uh, the purpose of this is actually the projects which are going on in Tata Center. Uh, you know, to give some kind of uh, understanding to you as to you know how we conceived of the project uh, and what methodology we are using. So the idea is not for you to get so much deep understanding of the project itself but more about how a project can be thought of, uh, designed and uh, you know some research, uh, relevant research uh, uh, methods can be put in place and uh, you know how we are expecting to test or validate our outcomes. Okay. So, you can become any problem in any domain and it will naturally follow the similar uh, trends. Right? So, an important key for all this is of course, we will usually work in our domain of expertise. Right? So, when we pick a research problem, there are many, many, many problems in the world to solve. But obviously, a given person has a certain domain knowledge or a certain specialization. So, we will tend to pick uh, problems where we think we can contribute uh, in some way to the solution. Okay? So, I will give you that sort of a background as to what my expertise is and you know why I chose that particular problem to work on and how I went about it and why the challenges that I see over there and how am I going to measure the success of my uh, work. Okay. Uh, so, maybe we will have a quick uh, round of introductions. You are all from which uh, department? So, uh, you are from, yeah, don't please don't stand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mainly I want to know what your background is. is yeah. It? So, I am Ulas Kumar Raut and I am working in the position of Associate Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at College of Science and Technology, Bhuvaneshwar. Bhuvaneshwar, madam. Yes. It is College of Science and Technology and Bhuvaneshwar. Bhuvaneshwar, okay, fine. Yeah. I am Dr. Tapaskar Patra uh, from the Institution and Electronics Department okay, from okay. CT Bhuvaneshwar, Odisha. Okay, very good. So, two of you have come from there. Or? Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, okay, so. Hello ma'am, this is Navarsha. I am from Engineering College Bikane from okay. CSE department. CSE, okay, great. Good morning ma'am, I am Dr. L.P. Panda oh. uh, from Government College of Engineering Kalandi, Bhavani Patna, Odisha. Okay. I am from Humanities Department and oh, Social Science and Management background. Oh, I see, okay. okay. Uh, good morning madam, uh, myself Ajit Kumar Patnaik. Uh, I'm working as the assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, okay. Government College of Engineering, Kalahandi, Bhavani Patna, Odisha. Okay, okay. I'm Arka Singh. I'm in Electronics in the Department at UT Uttarakhand. Yeah, yeah, you can take that here. Good morning, ma'am. I'm Srikanya. I'm working as assistant professor in uh, Government Engineering College, Bikanir. Uh, in VA, electronics and communication okay, engineering, great. and also I'm pursuing PhD in MNIT Jaipur okay. in VLS. In VLS. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, I am Devi Prasad Das. I am working as assistant professor in the department of instrumentation and electronics okay. engineering in CD Bhuvneshwar. Good morning, ma'am. I am Anjan Kumar Sahu, assistant professor electrical engineering, College of Engineering and Technology, Bhuvneshwar. Good morning ma'am, this is Sulek Sharma from Government Engineering College Bikaner and from CSC department. Okay. okay, so we have a lot of people from Bikaner and from I think at least two colleges in Orissa. No? Fine. Okay, great. Anyway, what is uh, in, uh, you know, interesting and uh, you know, good for me is that all, many of you are from electronics, electrical and instrumentation except for the mechanical professor and of course social science. But uh, I think uh, for you at least to get overall picture of you know, what technology can do uh, in terms of uh, you know, social problems, so your comments of course are most welcome. Okay, so great. So I think you will uh, be able to, uh, I mean I will be able to convey to you a bit of the science and technology also behind the project because uh, you know you people are from the electrical engineering background. Okay, so this is, we are solving a real, real problem. So my area is actually signal processing. Uh, so, what's commonly called DSP, digital signal processing, but uh, signal processing as you know is actually a bunch of mathematical tools uh, and of course, although it's very mathematical and you know it's basically about applying uh, you know some 
uh, mathematical uh, you know transforms uh, and so on to data or to signals in order to achieve some particular end it's also highly practical so all those tools are really motivated by the fact that they are associated very closely with some important signal properties right and they therefore can be used to solve certain problems okay uh, so what happens usually is since it's so tied to the practice uh, that people who do any research in signal processing usually work in some domain because in order to apply those methods effectively uh, you need to understand the problem area that you're working in so for example you know of people who work on images medical biomedical uh, signals and so on so they have to understand the problem and what more or less they are looking for to solve uh, and then they can choose the appropriate signal processing techniques so likewise my area is the area of audio or sound uh, so I basically have an understanding of the nature of sound and how information is embedded in sound signals right and that is what I will be uh, that's basically so I look for problems around speech uh, music uh, we could even apply it to environmental sound so anything in the form that is the audio form or acoustic form really uh, is something that uh, you know I feel uh, equipped uh, to deal with. Okay, so the the data center project that I'm working on is about uh, applying signal processing to a specific uh, problem in uh, audio. Please stop me if you have any questions. Okay, so it's not that I have to cover a you know definite material. It's more to at least you know to just give you an appreciation. Also here any questions or you know critical comments or any comments that you might have okay so about audio uh, signal processing uh, so what you see on top is a waveform okay so I think all of us are familiar if you take a microphone like this one and you uh, connect it uh, to some uh, storage or to a voice recorder or to a PC and record then what you will get is a waveform which is signal values amplitude values versus time right uh, now that waveform is the only thing that we are using in speech communication to communicate to our listener and therefore that waveform embeds a lot of information right so what is that information that is embedded in the waveform hmm? so this no, I don't want you to tell me how it is embedded. My question is what is the information there that we are conveying by this wave? So I could store this waveform and I can play it out to a listener, right? So according to me, all the information is there in the waveform, right? Because we know we don't have to be talking face to face. Uh, we can even talk over telephone and so on and still convey all the information that we typically on it. Yeah, please. Yeah. Correct. Correct. See now the other thing I want to tell you is always listen to the question that somebody is asking and reply only I know you know more, more than I am asking because you obviously have that background. Correct. So the information maybe uh, you know I will ask you what is the information uh, in this signal? Right but there, by, you know you understand what I meant by information right. Info See why am I speaking because I want to convey some information. Correct. So how are we conveying that information when we speak? Yeah, sound, but it's more than that, right? It's not just about, uh, it's meaningful sound. The receiver and right. Once this process is complete, then... Correct, but what all information is there? So, supposing you hear this over the telephone, like you rightly said, there are syllables, but actually more importantly, there are words. Correct. And words are drawn from the dictionary of that language. Right? So, we have a language which has a lexicon or a dictionary. We choose words from that to convey our message. I'm conveying a message, right, by speaking, right. So most importantly, there are words over there. The sequence of words, the choice of words, and the sequence of words is there in this waveform. Correct. What else? What else can you make out if you hear a, a speech recording over the phone? Can it? Does it tell you something about the speaker? It does, right? So that information is also there, the gender. For example, the age also, you can make out whether somebody is young or old by listening to the voice. So that information. So I'm just telling you how much information is there in a simple waveform. This is just a two, three second waveform, right? 
the age and gender is also something we could make or make out. Of course, this one you can hear it, but it doesn't really make uh, this thing. I'll show you an actual waveform, huh? Indian costumes are quite colourful. I beg your pardon? Gender. So, you could make out this a female voice and she was talking English. It was an Indian speaker speaking English. How can we make out it's somebody from India or is somebody from the accent, right? So, we come to know their geographical background, maybe their socio-economic background and so on, right? You can usually tell from which class that person comes, which region of the country they are from because there is a big influence of their what we call first language, the L1, right? So, that information is also there, correct? And you can also tell something about the mental state, like the mood of the speaker, or at least the intended mood. Correct? And how can we tell that? Whether, you know, how the speaker is sounding? Correct. So, from the loudness uh, dynamics and from where, how they are varying, let us say, their pitch. Correct? So, you can make out whether they are, the, something about the mental state such as, okay, happy, angry, so on. You can also tell are they confident or not, right? Uh, or is it being told, said in a very, uh, you know, uh, sort of a doubtful manner. So, there are a lot of such shades of emotion that are conveyed through uh, speech, okay? Okay, so all of this is embedded in the waveform and when we are talking about extracting information from speech, it all depends on what problem we are trying to solve, right? We may be interested in one or more of this information that we just talked about, right? So, the signal processing methods that we are applying to this are about essentially doing some operations on the waveform, mathematical operations on the waveform to get that information. Okay. So, what I will do is I will give you an example in an audio editor of a waveform where we can examine this information a little more closely, right? And then uh, basically that is like the, the background uh, science or technology behind this uh, project and then I will move on to the project itself. Okay, so I just play this uh, waveform and uh, then we'll see where how we get that information that's embedded. Machli jal ki hai rani, jeevan uska hai pani. Okay, so very very uh, simple five second waveform. The person, the male speaker, he spoke a lot of words, something like ten words, right? It's possible to break this into segments corresponding to the words, right? But the words, one thing very important in audio is the fact that there is a temporal sequence. I have to, the words are uttered in a particular sequence, correct? So, time sequence is very important for us. The meaning will change if we change the time sequence of the words, correct? So, what we really need to look for in this thing, what are the words, in what, you know, sequence they are uh, said, uh, that is about the message itself, the text content or the lexical content of the message. Okay, now where is this information? So, for example, I can break this up into few words. Correct, I can look uh, look at this in terms of a zoomed in form. So, let us listen to this. Machli jal. Okay, machli jal, that is what all that happened here. So, this, I can actually look at each of these sub segments. So, we see that there are some drastic changes, right, in the waveform, okay. So, if we further break this down, we will find out that this part of the waveform corresponds to ma, a, this whole noisy part is cha, because the way we utter cha, there is a lot of aspiration noise. So, this is cha. L e. So, this whole word is going to be machli. Okay. So, indeed the distinct segments in the waveform correspond to those particular sounds. Okay. So, the words of a language are made up of elemental units and what are the elemental units? Letters. Yeah, they are letters in writing, but what do we call them in? Huh? Elemental means basic. So, what are the basic uh, units? They are, we call them phonemes. They are, they are similar to letters, right? So, when you write, you use letters. English alphabet has 26 letters, right? But sounds are called phonemes, right? So, can you t uh, uh, tell me what some of the phonemes are? Something like B, B is a phone, right? Uh, R, E, E. Yeah. 
No, so actually uh, in a language, typically languages would have 50 phones or so uh, and the way we actually learn the alphabet in if you use Devanagari or any other Indian languages, it is considered very phonetic, right? So we learn the phonemes in a very systematic way. So you have the vowels, o, i, e, uh, then you have pa, 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 ma, and ka, 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 and so on. So you have the table itself, that table is the phonemes, right? So we essentially put those phonemes together in a sequence to get words, okay? So in fact, the speech signal is actually also composed of that, is basically giving you the sequence of phonemes and therefore the sequence of words, okay? Okay, now it turns out that if you have to recognize these phonemes, so if we recognize these patterns, then we should be in principle able to recognize the words, correct? Okay, so now you can see I have labeled the words over here. So in the bottommost uh, tier, you can actually see the words. Okay, so this is the whole machli, like we said over here, then this is ja and so on, right? Okay, so now uh, it's in principle we, we, we could work in the bottom up fashion by identifying each of the phonemes and therefore finding out the words which are spoken, right? So that would be a way of information extraction. But how do we determine the phonemes? It turns out that although there we can see some distinct segments between the waveforms, there's a lot of variability in the waveform, okay? What is a better signature or a better pattern for a particular phoneme is this spectrum. Okay. okay, now this is actually a frequency spectrum, but it is a frequency spectrum that is continuously changing in time because as we speak, we are uttering different sounds and the spectrum is continuously changing, correct? But it is a spectral pattern that we are able to decode and able to identify as a specific sound. Okay. So, for example, the ch, it has more high frequency components. So this dark line is like a, the dark is high and white is low. This is at a particular time. So this is the time of the ch sound. So we see uh, this is the frequency axis. So we see in ch sound, there is a very high frequency concentration above about 3 kilohertz, 3000 hertz, right? Similarly, ma has very low frequency. It has almost absence of high frequency content, okay? So this is the structural signature that we use when we do, for example, speech recognition, right, in order to identify the underlying sounds, okay. Okay, what else? Any questions at this point? Okay, so this is actually a speech analysis software called PRAT, P -R -A -A -T. So there are many audio, I don't know, have you people used audio editors? Anybody has used an audio editor? Okay, you should actually and especially uh, I think in students also find it very interesting if you are trying to explain some. So this one is a speech analysis software called Prat. It is a very sophisticated Dutch software. It is free but it is meant more for clinicians and all that to extract you know for parameters or you know researchers who are working in speech. So it is very very advanced. We are using only the audio editor part of it. But you can also get another way, free and very popular software which is used for both speech and music. It's called Audacity. Okay, so that's also free. So what do audio editors do? They allow you to work on a waveform, right? They show you the spectrum. You can do various things with this. For example, you can select a portion, you can amplify it, you can filter it and change the sound and so on. So Audacity is something that's really quite interesting and even if you use it in your teaching, I think students get very interested. So you can work on speech waveforms, music waveforms, any kind of audio and do very uh, nice manipulation just like in a text editor you would do uh, with written text, you can work on uh, audio waveforms. Okay, so in principle we are able to get it. Now if there is more to it than this, right? What other, where is all the other information? Can you tell me? What was the other information we were talking about? Huh? 
this is that uh, words information, correct? Where is all the other? What, is, what else could we make out from the waveform? Okay. So, energies, of course, are you know, some parts are soft, some parts are loud. In this case, of course, it is a phonetic quality. When we say consonants are always more soft than vowels, right? We cannot say consonants very loudly. So, in fact, that is another way to determine that where are the consonant portions and where. So, all these big amplitude portions are the vowels by and large, okay? So, what was the other information we said you can get from the gender? How can we get the gender from this waveform? The so called pitch, right? Now, frequency is a very generic term. Everything is frequency. All this is frequency, right? So, we are talking more of the pitch of the voice, which is the fundamental frequency, correct? So, how do we get the fundamental frequency? We need to look at the harmonics because it is a periodic sound, right? So, I will just, uh, if I, I can show that to you also in this. Uh, okay, so if I change this spectrum to a different kind of spectrum where I can actually see all the harmonics of the sound, then we will see how easy it is to make out the pitch of the voice, okay. Now, you can see what are the harmonics. So, all the vowels, they are because they are highly periodic, the spectrum is harmonic. Harmonic means what? There is a fundamental frequency and there are integer multiples of the fundamental present. The lowest fundamental gives you the pitch, okay. So, now I just play it and you listen to hear this sound. It says, jalki hai rani. The pitch goes up, right. So, you can just listen for that. Machli jalki hai rani. Jeevan okay. uska hai pani. Okay, so the last bit Pani ended by going down and uh, Rani ended here going up, right? Now, why was the speaker speaking like that? What was the information being conveyed? When he said, Machli Jalki hai Rani, Jeevan uska hai Pani. Now, why will it? Huh? Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So, when we speak, see when you read, what happens is you have a lot of punctuation indicators, right? When you see a text, you know that if there is a comma or if there is nothing, that the sentence is still continuing. When we speak, we do not say comma, full stop, what not. We have to convey it via our speaking, right? So, that is exactly what the speaker is doing. He's, he wants to pause because there is a phase phrase break because that group of words belongs together. He did not break much jal. Ki hai rani. Now, that would have been very difficult for the listener to understand, but you say machli jal ki hai rani. Okay, great. That is one complete chunk of words. It makes sense, but now there is going to be a new phrase starting, but it is not complete yet and the completion is indicated by the pitch falling. Okay. So, we are conveying all this information about syntax also. Syntax means like the punctuation and so on by the pauses. So, this is also something in principle we can detect in the waveform. So, in this Pratt editor, it also shows you in blue the pitch trace. So, it says machali jalki hai rani, right? So, it is also showing you the trace of the pitch versus time. The way they obtain it by computation of this fundamental, okay? So, you need to find the harmonic structure and identify the fundamental frequency and that will give you the pitch versus time and that gives us additional cues and those additional cues are, of course, we come to know the gender because we can see the pitch range of the speaker is whatever it is. It is marked over here on this side, 130 uh, hertz is marked here. So, maybe around 100 hertz or so, maybe these points. So, 100, 100 hertz, 130, 40 hertz is more like male voice. Female voice will be 150 and above. I mean, there are obviously huge overlaps in the range, right? And then, of course, the way the person, uh, the speaker pose, and this silence is a pause. So, we know that it was like a, a phrase was ending, right? And eventually, of course, the sentence itself ended, right? So, all of this information is embedded in the way. Okay, any questions at this point? Anything else that you would like to know? Okay, so I'll just move on to, so as I said, is the area I work in is about is sound uh, processing uh, and it is based entirely on uh, <laughs> extracting information from speech signals for a particular problem, okay. 
So the problem that we chose to work on is an area known as call that is computer aided language learning. Okay? So we are trying to build tools for language learners okay? and it's a, it's a quite old area and it includes all kinds of uh, modalities of language, written language and so on. So a lot of researchers working uh, on various aspects of this. Uh, so because my domain is signal processing applied to voice or audio signals, we are working on the spoken language part of it. That is by spoken language meant speech, correct, not written language, spoken language. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We are trying to assess the fluency of spoken language. So the point is I am not trying to recognize what somebody is saying per se. You must have used, have all of you used the voice recognition on the phone? Does it work? So what do you use it for? Which one do you use? That is the, the Android one, the Google voice. Okay, okay. So can you give me an example of something uh, that you may have tried or... So, it, achha, you try to find, but does it recognize? Whether, huh? No, no, that is, it's not text to speech, speech to text. Speech, no, no, both are there, but we are talking about the recognition part, correct. So, that is speech to text, but I, what I want to know is, Okay, okay. So, is there some particular pattern you have noticed about what kind of uh, speech it fails for? Huh? Some smaller? Ah, okay, 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 okay. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Oh. Oh. Okay, it sometimes mistakes that. Okay, so uh, actually the way these models work, so there are two parts they have. They have something called an acoustic model, which is actually seeing the patterns that we I showed you. It show, it actually sees the frequency uh, patterns of the sound and tries to the recognition engine. It tries to uh, attach or find some sounds which have similar patterns, right? But it also uses some other top-down model which is called a language model. Okay, so that is a world model. So what is a world model? It is they know what are the most probable utterances that people are going to make. Maybe a lot of people asking for the weather, right? So even if you mispronounce weather or you say it differently because of accent or because of the, you know, speaking it in different ways and so on, it's highly likely to find that simply because it attaches a large probability to the, that particular message. Okay. So very often it will tell you some things even if you say it very badly but if you ask some very rare kind of query right which is not in the language model which is not typical it will have a very tough time identifying that even if it is there in the acoustic waveform. So when I teach this speech course you know undergraduate students they try all kinds of tricks so there was one student who was trying to tell his phone please do not wake me up at 5 a.m. and it would not get what do you think it recognized it as? Please wake me up at 5. It absolutely refused to recognize that. Because although the word not was very much in the waveform. Now that is because the dominance of the language model. Right? So that's one of the things that we have. And the, what they do is essentially, basically they have, you know, listened to or collected data on a lot of queries and build that. And why is it important? Because the acoustics can very often be a little uh, ambiguous. So they have to rely on the language model. If they relied only on the acoustic model, it really would not work very well. It would give all kinds of garbage and there would be some phone sequences that don't even form words properly and so on. So they need to know which language it is and what is the lexicon of the language and of course more importantly, what are the typical phrases and sentences in that language. Okay. Okay. So when we are trying to do this kind of a task, we found out you cannot use, so what we are trying to do now is, so we'll come back to that question. Okay, so I'll come to the problem and then we'll talk about, you know, why it's a challenging task and why it requires some special attention. Uh, so we are looking at spoken language fluency and the particular context is of acquiring basic of, of literacy, right, to figure out, uh, you know, you notice about assessment over there, right, assessment means we are trying to evaluate something. So we are trying to evaluate something in the context of literacy. Right? And the way literacy is evaluated is by actually making a child read something aloud, 
right? And what we want to build is something that can actually facilitate reading and also practice. But at this moment, we are working on automatic feedback and assessment. So we would like to collect a recording of the child reading and then we would like to analyze that recording and we would like to give feedback on how well, how whether the child is of a certain level of literacy is able to read at a certain level and maybe sort of rate the child in terms of uh, you know how far they are, are they very good or are they still poor or so on, okay, but automatically. So this is something like a teacher would do, ask a child to read something and okay, so then in that case we need to understand how does one evaluate reading, right, so reading apparently is evaluated by accuracy and rate, right, accuracy means how correctly the words are read, so you show the child some text and is the child able to recognize those words and utter them, speak them. Okay, that means they can read. So reading is not about just reading the alphabet, but about recognizing the words and being able to pronounce them, right? So that's about accuracy. Rate means the speed. It's very important to read or speak at a certain speed, right? Because if they're reading very slowly, then that is indicative of low reading skill, correct? Which is the same as maybe speaking very slowly. It's very tough for a listener to keep track of what you're saying if you're going to utter words just, you know, with so much space between them and so on. So all of these things we like to mention, but there's one more component and that is what we call expression or prosody, right? Which is what we saw in the Machli sentence. So now that speaker clearly understood what he was supposed to say. He knew that there is a phrase here. He knew the phrase has not ended. He knew the sentence ended, right? So children who can read and actually read and make sense of the text, only they will be having the right pitch variation, right? And the right pauses. So all those pitch variation and pauses come in something called expressiveness or prosody. So prosody is a word that we use. So there is text, but with the text there is also some expressiveness which is conveying the structure or the syntax. Okay. So when a child starts learning to read, they are only reading these individual words, right? And later they become more uh, f familiar with the words themselves, they start understanding more they start using their cognitive skills to do more than just utter the words one after the other. They will start making phrases, making sentences, you know, highlighting the important words and so on. And all of those are also embedded in the signal and we can in principle do signal processing to extract them, right? So we would like to give fluency indicator based on all this. Okay, for, so let me just introduce you to, uh, I don't know if you have heard of this Asar. Have you heard of Pratham, the organization? Okay. And I recently, of course, they became very famous because of the Nobel Prize winners who did their, Abhijit Banerjee and uh, Duffler, who did all their research actually, some of their research uh, experimental methods in this. So this organization, they conduct a very huge, uh, I don't know if I have a picture of that, I'll just see if I have that. So they collect, uh, conduct a very huge uh, annual survey. Uh, where they go to many, many villages across India and then they go to all those village schools. Yeah, so they go to all those village schools and they present uh, material to those uh, children. They essentially show them So it's huge actually. Uh, they try to poll uh, this, I think they do some sampling, they obviously can't do all the children, so it's highly manual process. So this is a typical scenario, this is probably somewhere in the northeast. So here the Asar volunteer, so they have some tens of thousands of volunteers whom they give them some basic training, so they have to go and pick children from the village and just sample, so they get some fair uh, number of children who would consider to be representative of that particular school or that particular village and then they show them a paper and then the child has to read out and they have to tick and then they are given some sort of uh, rules by which they can declare whether the child is of that grade level or a lower grade level and then they go and they publish all these results which actually comes out in the newspaper every year that how many children who can read standard percentage children who can read standard two level text Okay, so they took standard four children and found out that the percentage which can read standard two level text was in 2010, it was only 30%. So 30% of the standard four children can read standard two. So these are the kind of, uh, you know, 
evaluations they are trying to come out with and the way they are doing it is by actually going to these villages asking children to read out material and uh, you know evaluate it. Okay. So now the point is that this is a very strong motivation for us to so this is for example the text that they show. So if a child of class 4 ideally should be able to read something like this. So it's not only, it's not English, actually English is very little. Uh, it's, uh, depend, it's a vernacular of that language and in some states they do English and now because of so much demand for English they also for, apart from the uh, regional language they are also doing English for the same children. So suppose they are expecting a class 5 child to read this then they will give them this and then they will ask them if they cannot read this they will go to a lower level which is simple sentences. Uh, and if the child cannot read that, they will ask them to read words. And if the child cannot manage words, they will ask them to read out the letter. So they will then declare this is a letter child or this is a words child and so on. And then they come up with all those uh, statistics. Okay, so these are the kind of rules they give them. So the volunteer goes and then they are asked to do this, go from one to the other, start from the high level, then keep going down, so on and so forth. Then they tell the volunteer that you can declare a child is at a particular level if they make less than three mistakes. Then they tell them what is a mistake, what is not a mistake and so on. So there are all these rules. Okay, so the volunteer is listening, applying the rules and then making a tick against the level of the child and that is what they are using. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so this is what we would like to automate because naturally they are very very uh, constrained by the human resources required to conduct this test and uh, time it takes and so on. So can you think of some way that we could automate this? How to automate? Automate means we make it automatic. Correct, instead of involving manual, you saw the resource, you know, one first teacher or whatever volunteer goes, sits with each child, shows them a paper, listens to the child, ticks and then decides whether that child is of their level or of a lower level. Hmm? Correct, so that's exactly what we are talking about. So if we had a recording, so we could just give them a tablet or something and just show them the text on the tablet, right, and ask them to read, right, and then that recording could in principle be given to a system which can find, evaluate the speech using the same rules that they are using, correct. So the rules that they are using was what I showed you that is about the words that uttered wrong but there are some other interesting aspects I think. Uh, okay yeah uh, what is a mistake is here. Okay so this is a bit interesting. The child can read a paragraph, so this is the rule, right? Read that, okay, so it's not at paragraph level, so you've given them a paragraph to read, but according uh, to the guidelines, they are not considered acceptable, they are not at paragraph level if they do any of things, make more than three mistakes, and mistakes have been defined over there. So if they have some accent because of their language, that's not to be considered a mistake, because the children don't know how it's to be pronounced, right? But they still are able to decode the word, so that's not a mistake. So they tell them that, what are the not a mistakes, uh, reads the text haltingly and stops very often, not allowed, right. How would we make out from the signal that they are haltingly reading with men and stopping often? Hmm? Time, yeah, amount of time it will take and of course you can see all the silences. Huh? Exactly, so we saw the pause in the signal, right. So we could, we can find the pauses. We can do some signal processing to look for the silent regions because those are the uh, regions without any frequency content which are very low energy and so on, right? Okay, let's look at the next one. Reads a text like a string of words but not like a sentence, right? So how would we read it like a string of words? Suppose we were reading the Machili, uh, huh? Yeah, bigger and there will be no particular dis distinction between ending of a phrase and between words in a phrase and so on. So you say machli, jal, ki, hai, rani, jeevan. So all the words are spoken in the same manner, right? There is no 
yeah, Space Shadow World and no, uh, no attempt to cluster or bunch the words together in meaningful units together. Correct, correct. So the pitch pattern. So all of that is reflected there. So when we looked at this, we thought that this is a really nice problem to work on because all the things that they are looking for by the human volunteer, uh, you know, spending time and trying to, uh, you know, analyze apart from having to train all these volunteers is of something we could in principle automate, right? So if we had an automatic uh, solution, then we should be able to give feedback we sh they should be able to in principle assess many more children, the whole scope will increase uh, and it will be faster and also it will be somewhat objective because now no matter how much you train the volunteers, there is some amount of error in their judgment because maybe they were not paying attention, maybe there was something else going on and so on. So there is always one you know part of the uh, you know uh, uh, this thing that is there is going to be human error but if we automate it then Assuming the machine gets all this right, we should be able to, right? Yes. Yes, you are absolutely right. There are, that is the thing, humans are very resilient uh, to uh, degradations in the environment. So that is a challenge that we face, right? So some of this data that we are looking at, for example, you can hear the child speak, but there is a tractor passing by honking, uh, you know, tractor uh, uh, that reverse horn going on. Or there are some uh, hens and chicken, uh, uh, you know, making uh, uh, sounds and so on. So that is a challenge and the human volunteer obviously our, so far all these automatic systems have not achieved human performance, right? Humans are much, much more able to pay attention to the child in front. So those are the limitations we face. So we have, yeah. Right, but signal processing techniques to do that in a combined signal is very difficult, okay? So are you able to do it or not? Usually we can do in the human as a Correct, correct. Right, right. Because actually we are using more cues. For example, why do we have two ears? One ear would have been fine, right? Like one nose, of course we have two nose. Huh? Stereophonic. So what how does it help us? Exactly. So we are able to localize, right? So because we are receiving two signals, I am able to make out the direction in which my speaker of interest is coming, right? So there is a lot of noise in the room, but I want to listen to you. I can make out that you are from this direction and pay attention to that direction, right? So now our typical phones and all that, our microphone, if we instead of one microphone, if we had on a, an array of microphones, it would behave like two ears. And we could do something called beam forming, where we actually start looking only in a particular direction to emphasize or enhance the signal of interest. Uh, it's possible to get a slightly better signal. Okay. So yes, these are all possible, uh, you know, further solutions, right? But right now we would have to impose some requirements on this recording business and that is the child should be in a relatively quiet room and read uh, in other thing. Okay, now assuming we can make a recording, so maybe at this point I can just show you a case of the data we are collecting. So we are trying to build this system by collecting our own data. Uh, we are also working with Pratham to automate the test where they are supplying the data. So they, have, they are supplying our data of Hindi from UP and Rajasthan. So they have already started this collecting the data in terms of using tablet instead of pen and paper uh, type of volunteer. But they are not doing the evaluation automatically yet because that system is still to be built. Okay? But the conditions in which we would like children to be record, unlike what you saw in that photo there, so the way we are doing data collection and the way they are also doing now is very uh, similar. So we did one pilot in one school in Hubli. Turns are short and skip children don't like me. This is showing the text, yeah. the tablet. The next morning when that little tree woke up to it had big news just like like the mango trees. Now I am happy, said the bubbly trees. Okay, so this is how we are doing our data collection because if we want to build this system, we need data, right? So we have these stories which are put on the tab. The 
text on the tab, right? And you divide that into paragraphs of roughly 20 seconds each. The child opens that, looks at the text and starts reading and the recording gets stored and these are all the children waiting to do that test. So there were some 30 children who came and did this. We spent about one hour in that school uh, collecting all the recordings. The child has a login or there is a user ID. So there is some metadata about the child being stored. Which class, name of the child, class of the child and any other background information we want to record. The name of the school and so on. And all this data we are bringing back. right? Our goal is to be able to give an assessment of this reading to the child in terms of roughly on those lines whether the child is able to recognize the words, what is the pace at which they read, is it too slow, too fast, right? Is the child expressive in the sense is the child understanding and indication of understanding is they are able to read fluently which means they are able to you know bunch the words together, realize the full stops and all that properly, right? So that's the kind of analysis we are trying to do of this. So once we have the recording, of course, if we want to build a system, we need first the manual annotation of the recording. Somebody has to go and manually annotate it because the system is going to try to give those same judgments that a human uh, annotator or human uh, listener would, right? So. Although there are rules, because there is so much variability in nature or in the speech signal, we need to be able to learn those rules from the data. So we can have some rules in place, but the very fine aspects of the rule, such as for example, whether the pronunciation of a particular word is acceptable or not, uh, whether the grouping of words into phrases is done correctly or not, those are things, those rules we want to learn from the data. Okay. So this turns out to be not only a signal processing uh, problem where we are extracting many features from the signal such as the spectrum, such as the pitch, such as the intensity. We are also using some machine learning in order to take our annotators or so called human expert ratings and try to map these features to those human ratings. Okay. So any questions? Ma'am, yeah. Ma'am, how much uh, means effect can X and make on uh, judging a children on the basis of levels? Means if uh, it is possible that uh, just because of X and the children could be in one level and should be in the another level like that. Correct. Again, that is why we need to learn rules from the data. Okay. So clearly, from the ASR guidelines, accent should not count as a mistake. Okay, that is what they are saying. Now, it could be in another task. Suppose we are going to some uh, city school where they are trying to make children speak English very well. They are already can read well and so on. But when so their notion is that they should be able to pronounce the words correctly. Right? So, it all depends on what the task is. So, in principle, from the signal, we can also extract this information that the word which was supposed to be said, let us say, uh, as bed, B-E-D, bed, they might say bad. Correct? Now, that's clearly an accent issue because that particular phone they are not that familiar with, right? Now whether we want to count it as a mistake or not, that's up to us. But our low level signal processing should be able to extract that the vowel uttered here was not A, it was A. Correct? Right? Yeah. So our system essentially should be very, very sensitive to all sorts of things and later the rules can come on top of it. Okay, and the rules also can be learned. Suppose I, I don't have to go and ask, suppose I give it to a lot of raters and they all tick the word as correctly pronounced and I should be able to make out that bad is an acceptable pronunciation for bad for those raters and my machine uh, data based learning, my machine learning should work and be able to tell me that it was not a mistake, right? It was a correct data. Okay. So these days, of course, you must have heard machine learning is extremely, uh, you know, kind of being applied. But the big problem in machine learning is you need a lot of data, right? So whereas I can sit down and as a human expert or ask an English teacher and the English teacher because of their experience and all maybe even able to tell you some rules. Okay, this is right, this is wrong, so and so forth and we could program it. But those are not very robust because they cannot possibly articulate all the fine shades of the rule. But on the other hand, if you give them hundreds of recordings and you ask them, okay, now you don't tell me any rules, you apply your rules yourself, whatever your rules are or whatever your intuition is, just mark this data for me and then I will use my machine learning algorithm to find the mapping, right? So that's the approach we are taking. <coughs> but in that approach, we need to get lots of data. So lots of data is very you know, difficult process because we have to do all those recordings and then we have to get it rated by human raters, right? 
and then we can use it for our work. So this whole thing, I mean solving a problem in engineering is not about just applying fancy mathematical algorithms, but also all this hard work of identifying that this is what you need and mobilizing that. Like many of these places, I went myself to that Bellarvada and actually, of course we gave some instructions to that teacher, but we pretty much had to be there. Uh, you know, to ensure. So, there is all this work involved and typically the people who understand what they want to do with it are the best judges to design that protocol also. You can't just expect I'll just sit in my chair in my office and all the data will come to me and then I'll do some very clever, you know, machine learning on it. The clever <laughs> machine learning is only a small part of that system building. Okay. Okay, any uh, questions? Okay, and about the challenges, now these are some of the cases, you know, you can imagine that this is a photo of uh, one of the early data recording. We, do. We, we told, we took the children to a room, this is a village near Mumbai in Dahanu, to a room uh, where nobody else was there, only the child was there, but then you can see how many other things were going on, right? All the other children came to the window. So, it's very, very challenging to do this. So, you, uh, and we know that it's obviously going to be very noisy, you know, with so much of it. Uh, yeah, but what happens is for noise cancellation to work, typically the noise should be what is called stationary. You know, if it is changing noise background, it's very difficult. And normally in schools we have found there is, you know, from the distance also you can hear children screaming and running, playing and all kinds of sounds, uh, which are continuously changing. So, the noise cancelling which uses the reference sound to cancel also does not work very well because the changing, changing so much. And the point is we cannot use more and more expensive hardware. We have to do this in as limited product. and the, you know it has to be rugged, robust and so on. So, there are many constraints on the kind of hardware also we can use. I beg your pardon? Hmm? Yeah. No, here it is. Take, take, take. Uh -huh. Uh, Ma'am, regarding the pitch of the uh, kids, like uh, even their voice change from level okay. to level. So, does this actually take an even that signal? Okay, yes. So, for example, we are not only trying to do the speech recognition of the words, mm -hmm. right, but we are also trying to do their prosody parameters, like the pitch variation and all that, right. So, indeed the pitch changes, but what is this prosody about? See, even if you hear a new speaker whose pitch you never knew before, you are going to be able to make out whether they are ending the sentence properly, whether they are making the phrases properly, which words they are emphasizing, right? Because everything is relative, correct? So, when I speak and if I say a particularly important word, the what did I do? You did not know my pitch and you are not measuring my pitch, but what you are seeing is that in the context that word is standing out, right? And that is because relative to my pitch of the surrounding words, I emphasized it. Okay, so our algorithms essentially do some kind of a normalization for the speaker characteristics, correct? So that's all part of it, right? Okay, so right now we have got something like 150 or 200 distinct children for the English paragraph. So we are going by the English paragraph rate data. So we've got something like 150, 200 children. So it's about six, seven hours of data altogether, which is not very big, but. No, we went and we wanted to record as many children as possible in a school, correct? So then we had certain amount of time, maybe half a day, so we could record something like 20, 30, 40 children uh, in that time. Uh, class. Yeah, we actually we would like to do every child because then there's more data. But then it all depends, you know, whether uh, we are able to do that. And so we, at least in the school on campus, we went and asked for the role list and we went on many days and made sure we got all the children. So we want as much data as possible. And then of course the important thing is to rate it. So who will rate? So we found some retired English teachers who are sitting at home, we built an interface for them, they listen and they go on marking whether certain attributes are satisfied or not. Okay. Okay, so now we are in a situation that we are able to finally give a we would like to give a report card like this. So, when a child finishes reading, this is the speaker name, this is the child's uh, initials or whatever, the code for that child. This is the story the child read. 
uh, we have the student audio stored because we have a recording and we would like to give this kind of feedback. This is a mock up of the feedback that we want to give. Hard work always pays, but the child said peace instead of pays. So this is a substitution instead of earn came to a city, the child dropped the earth. So this is a deletion came to a city to earn, he said on, to earn the money, correct? So then we flagged it as an insertion. So we'd like to give this kind of feedback or rather this, now whether we count it as a mistake or not, that's up to us later. But this is sort of our feedback that the system should generate for us, right? We said the speed of the child, this is, uh, you know, somewhere like, uh, okay, maybe this would have been normal, so this is a little higher than normal. Phrasing is quite good, not that perfect and so on. So this is of course a mock-up, so I'm not interpreting all of this, but I'm just trying to show you where we are trying to go. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, more or less about the project. So we would like to turn this or we are working on turning this into an Android app for phone or tablet. And then what will happen is when the recording is made, it will, because this speech recognition is still a bit heavy to do on the device, so it will have to be sent over internet to a server. So you send it to a server, that is by calling an API, send the audio recording and it should return that report card, correct? And after that we can do whatever we uh, want to do with our data. So I'll just end this with one example of a data analysis we did in that Bellarvada school where you had that ch child, you know, reading. So this is in uh, near Hubli. So we recorded uh, children in class 5, 6 is what they call grade 1 English. So they've got some remedial English program there. Grade 1 is class 5, 6 children and grade 2 is class 7, 8 children. So we had 90 recordings from 27 children in all and then we just prepared some sort of uh, data analytics for them. So these were the stories there, right? Cat and the Rat, Little Bubble Tree, that is what the child was reading. So we plotted what is known, there's a very uh, well known uh, 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 parameter called words correct per minute. So it's very indicative of uh, the child's fluency. So we plotted their words correct per minute and to get some understanding of words correct per minute, hun above 100 words correct per minute, that means you count the correct words and then you count the duration it takes to read the whole passage. So that's words correct per minute. So it's more than 100 words correct per minute is considered good. Between 50 and 100 is fair and below 50 is poor. It's, you cannot understand the child at all because it's so slow and so few words are correct. Okay, so we made some analytics for them like this out of that whole set of 30 children and then we did it for two groups of children. There's class grade 1 who have been with them only for one year and grade 2 who have been with them for two years to show how many children were in the good category, fair category, poor category. So they found this very interesting because it gives them some nice monitoring mechanism. So they have their teachers who are supposedly trying some intervention, trying to make the children read better and if they go and do this, they can come to know whether the class composition is improving or not, right? They can do this once, they can do this once every month and figure out whether whatever learning interventions they're trying is actually helping the child to become more fluent, okay? So these are all the uh, possible outcomes. So we have found uh, in the course of the project, uh, thanks to Tata Center who is always, you know, uh, trying to expose the projects that they are supporting by means of uh, symposia and inviting people and you know uh, sending out material. I think you also must have received some brochure or projects and so on right, that are going on in Tata Center. Uh, so we've come across people who have shown a lot of interest mainly in this monitoring part. They say oh we have all these people teaching and all that but we don't know what impact it is having. Whether the child is children are actually getting better or not. Right. So they feel that this is very useful for generating automatic monitoring or report cards for the whole class and particular children also can be tracked the same Ma'am, what does this correct actually is containing? It is only about the pronunciation thing. You are absolutely right. So this particular metric, WCPM, is for the accuracy part, accuracy and speed. So I told you there are three things, accuracy, speed and expressiveness, right? In expressiveness, we put down all the things about the phrasing and the emphatic words and all that, okay? So this part, because it's very widely used, so there are, t it's actually a, this thing that is shown uh, a procedure that is actually used manually uh, in schools in order to uh, rate children. Yeah, I think I'm missing that particular card, but it's actually used to rate children manually. So they tell the teacher to hold a paper that the child is reading and mark the wrong words. So if they miss some word or miss one, just like I showed you in that mock-up. And then keep a stop clock and see the time. So it's a very old technique. So if you read the reading research published in the US and so on about reading curricula in schools, they use this technique. So our first step was, okay, this is a very well accepted technique. 
and it's quite objective because the teacher is forced to count and write the total. So there's nothing like, oh, how was it and so on, nothing much to think, correct? So our first role was let's automate this WCPM, okay? Yeah, yeah, it's an important piece and traditionally it has been used uh, by uh, uh, educators in school education, they use this WCPM. Okay. Now, what we are saying is we want to do something beyond this. We also want to look at the expressiveness and that's a research topic and that's I have a PhD student working. Can you have a question? Yeah. Uh, suppose uh, someone is speaking in Bengali, fine. Correct. And uh, we have a lot of dialect. Yeah. That when we are uh, talking that word, word correct per minute, uh, someone speaking in a different accent of the same Bengali correct. and, and uh, there is a proper pronunciation of that yeah, particular right. Bengali word. So, uh, what could be the procedure? Correct. So, that's exactly what I said that that we have to define. So, we need to figure out if it's a particular accent, what words, what all pronunciations are considered correct. Correct. So, you give it to the machine that these particular words can be uttered in these four different ways and all of them are correct. Okay. Any deviation from one of these four ways is wrong. Okay. So, that is called building the lexicon. So, when you specify the lexicon, what is the lexicon? I don't know, you people may have seen pronunciations in the old days. Now, of course, because of audio, what happens if you look up the word in a dictionary, you also get to hear the word, right? But in the old days, we could not hear the word. We had to know the pronunciation by, in the dictionary, had to give us a pronunciation using the phonetic alphabet, correct? You remember all those symbols for phonetic alphabet in the dictionary. And English is particularly tricky because the, the, often the spelling and the pronunciation have nothing to do with each other or very little to do with each other, correct? So, we had to rely on that. So, every speech recognition machine has a lexicon where the pronunciations are supplied in terms of the phones, right? So, as a bad, bad example that I gave you, we can write both of them as acceptable pronunciations. So, if you are looking at specific dialects, we should be very uh, particular to put the pronunciations of that dialect in the dictionary or the lexicon. For the output you are getting, you have to share with the school. Yeah, we have shared. So, what is the impact? Sir? No, that's what I'm saying. So, a lot of organizations are quite interested. So, school is one part of it, but there are other organizations above the school who are trying to monitor the prog the quality of the deliver delivery of the school. So, they would like to go in there and assess the children and have this so-called objective assessment to see whether the teachers are managing to this thing or what difficulties they're facing. And so. Okay, now right now it's only pilot. So, this Bellarvada which we did, we sent it to them and they are quite interested in actually incorporating it in their school year to do it on a regular basis. And they feel that they can even track, you can even track a particular child, correct? It's not just, this is the whole class statistics. So, they feel that even showing it to the parents will be very motivating that the children are actually getting better and it will just motivate them to, so they have some kind of a so-called objective indicator of progress. Oh, Bella is far from here, near Hubli in northern Karnataka, yeah. So, there is a Deshpande foundation which, which Tata Center has a tie-up and uh, they are working. So, those are actually their native tongue is Kannada, those children. So, so far we have tried in Maharashtra and in this one place in Karnataka, correct? But you are absolutely right, if we go to another region, the pronunciations are likely to be quite different and then we have to decide whether, uh, you know, what we give as the correct pronunciation of the word. It answers your question? No, that is children. The children have very high pitch voice. The question is that, so there are pitch ranges. It's not that uh, everybody has exactly that pitch. There are pitch ranges. Yeah. No, that is because of our physiology, you know, anatomy and physiology. The vocal cords which are here in your throat, they are the ones that vibrate. When you say, ah, and you place your hand over here, you will hear the, you can feel some vibration, correct? So, the length of the vocal folds, that is a physiological factor. 
that most of the work in the field of speech recognition is in Australia. So, the situation in which we are talking about your signal process. It is what? In the speech recognition, yeah. the saturation has come. Saturation. So, yeah, almost all work has been made for the researcher. I am not talking about this uh, signal processing. The SP and single processing is still there. And I don't know what you mean by saturation. That you are saying that all systems are working perfectly for all people. Saying maximally, all maximally the speech condition has gone caught up to the saturation level. There is limited scope of in the research. No, but it's okay. not a solved problem. Who said it's a solved problem? Which one? See, speech recognition. No, no, it's not solved problem. Right. But the work which has been uh, oh, brought right. to the. Okay, so you are saying that, no, that's why these machine learning uh, systems yeah, using more person. and more data are expecting to make better. Because recognition wise it is approached to the saturation. It is recognized, the words have been already recognized. No, that's and not true. Actually, uh, it's not at all true. Uh, there is, an S maybe for certain languages like American English and UK English and so on. No, most of the common language, most of the common language, not forget really. about the regional language that we are not saying, but ma ma maximum mass of the people it has been recognized. So, I don't know what your experience is, but maybe you are trying only the usual things, uh, you know, but if you just do a recording and give it to another recognized, chances are there will no, still see be the lot techni of techniques are the same. Whether no, you, you, talk, you talk about you, you talk about the Marathi words, whether you talk about the Bengali words, oh, whether you talk about the Chinese words, are not letters or another thing. The techniques is the more or less same for the recognition. Correct, but the point so, is that those languages, the resources are still few. Like he said about particular Bengali That is library, dialect. you have to make it strong. They are so not talking about make, Who is going to make it? Are you making it? No, people are making it. Which but, people are making it? Nobody I'm is working on so many Indian languages. No, no. Nobody can recognize that Bengali you're dialect not, you're is talking about. Actually, you are not getting my point what I am supposed yeah. to say. You are talk, talking about the library. I am yeah. not talking about the library. Fine, fine. Recognition part is the maximum techniques has been already, already it has been formed and it has been already in place. Only thing is that you have to make your library strong for the different regional words or letters. That's what. But single processing and machine learning which is we can add tools, then there is a lot of scope. That's what I wanted to. Uh, okay. Ma'am, so, yeah. uh, ma uh, does this use US English or the UK English uh, version? It use means who uses it? I mean, the, uh, the thing that you have designed. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. does it collect uh, uh, the recognition part? Yeah. Does it actually uh, connect it with a UK English no, term? No. Or so, a what we have done is the phone uh, models, uh -huh. which are the acoustics of the phone, have been taught from children, our uh, children's speech only. So, we had some good children read okay. out. Okay, so it's yeah. from. So, we uh, have another data set. Okay. We collected a lot of children reading English and Hindi. The reason Achha. for putting Hindi is because a lot of phones we use, although they are so called same as English phone, we pronounce them in a different way. So, it's Indian English it's basically. Indian English of the children. Of okay, that, that you've already. Group, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And it's only used for English till now. It's not for uh, other languages. No, no, it's not. But the Pratham project we are doing, we are going to use it to Hindi. But we feel okay. we might have to do a little bit of retraining there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it turns out that, see, accent has two parts. One is how you utter the words and also the way you speak. Okay. So, in fact, uh, you know, linguists and all that, they know that your accent is determined not so much by the word pronunciation, but by what we call the prosody of the speech. Okay. Uh, because we have a certain rhythm in speaking and you know Indians, it's supposed to be syllabic, we utter every syllable. But if you hear a UK English speaker, they clip a lot of the words, you know, they make only some syllables prominent. So it's not a pronunciation difference, it's also about how you vary the pitch and duration and the, uh, you know, rhythm. That's why I asked. Exactly. So now for that, uh, see when you look up, there are lots of books on Indian English. They will tell you, you don't have to sound like a UK speaker. You don't have to sound like an American. You have to sound like a good Indian, Indian speaker, English speaker. Then you ask them, okay, so what is so-called good Indian English? And they will say, okay, we should be mutually ed intelligible. All Bengali should understand all Marathi people, all Oriya people should understand all Tamil people. Anybody speaking English should be understood. Now, that itself is a quite good definition because hopefully our Indian news readers on TV are of that category because they are being heard by all over the country. Uh, so, okay, there are some Indian English pronunciations and let's agree that we'll all speak that. But then there's also the prosody, you know, how you speak with. For that, there are no rules because apparently that should be quite similar. You should be pausing in the same, phrasing in the same way. You should be emphasizing in the same way. But we do use different techniques and that's actually part of our research, you know, to train on how we speak. So, if I want to make something important like... I am not going home today and home is important. I am not going home today. 
but in American English, well, I'm not going home today, right? What did they do? They raised the pitch. Whereas what did we do? We increased the thing. I'm trying to make the word prominent, but I prefer to make the word that only I did. And that's how we speak, right? So we make the words long or loud, whereas the UK and American English, they just raise the pitch of that word. Right? But they are all correct because you understood what I meant, the important word and so on. So that's also that's what you are trying to learn from the data. Because that's also not something that somebody is going to tell you, okay, this much it went down, that much, you know, so we have to learn it from the data. So you already have recorded. Uh, we have recorded all these emphatic words. We, the, our raters are also marking those. They listen and say, what do you think is made emphatic by the child? It could be wrong because the child has not understood they are emphasizing anything they want. But what did you perceive as a human listener? Correct? And that's important for us to build up. Okay? Okay, great. So thanks for your attention. Yeah, I hope you got something out of it.